The gentleman proves that not every single January theatrical release is a total piece of garbage. Taika Waititi, cinema's serious goofballs and talks to do another Star Wars film. I've revealed my top 10 films of the last decade, and Mean Girls the Musical is getting a movie adaptation, for reasons I just can't seem to figure out why. I'm Joe Asterno, this is Real Talk. Alright, so welcome back. I was feeling just a bit under the weather last week, so that's why I didn't get to give you guys another episode of the show. So without further ado, I'm just going to get right into it I'm, and review The Gentleman. The Gentleman follows a ruthless drug lord named Mickey Pearson as he tries to get out of the business by selling off his empire, very lucrative empire, to another wealthy aristocrat. The film is directed by Guy Ritchie of Sherlock Holmes and Aladdin fame and stars Matthew McConaughey, Charlie Hunnam, Michelle Dockery, Henry Golding, Jeremy Strong, Colin Farrell, and Hugh Grant. Now, the story, as you can tell, it seems very, it's a very simple story at its core, which is fine, because it never once feels shallow, and throughout its, I want to say, about two-hour runtime, it always feels entertaining. Um, but what makes this a very unique is how they go about telling the story. This story is told through kind of the lens of this one guy, this sleazy private investigator named Fletcher, played by Hugh Grant, and he's basically come up with a lot of dirt on the Empire and people surrounding the Empire of this drug lord, played by Matthew McConaughey. And he tries to essentially blackmail the entire organization by getting through to his um, right man, excuse me, right hand man, Raymond, played by Charlie Hunnam. He's the number two of Matthew McC McConaughey's character. And the way that he goes about it is this very, very theatrical, flamboyant, and almost cinematic storytelling, um, storytelling approach to basically everything that he's come up with and basically how he's attempted to fill in the gaps with all of his, with all the dirt that he's dug up on um, the Mickey Pearson empire. Now, in my opinion, Hugh Grant steals the show. He, like I said, he's this very smarmy, but at the same time, he's always fascinating. He's very, very charismatic, and he's just hilarious throughout. The way that he goes about saying certain things and joking about certain things. Now, my friend, one of my friends who I was watching this with said that since he looked at how, like, again, I joke about things and how this character jokes about things, and then he basically said that, you know, he's basically an older British you. Now, I guess <laughs> I'm going to take, I guess to take, I was taking that as a compliment because in my opinion, he was the best part of the movie. But, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, you know, I, I guess, I'll, yeah, I guess it's a compliment because he was definitely the most entertaining part of the film. It was a very unique role. Um, he put the role that he ends up playing in the entire story just doesn't, you know, it didn't exactly sum up to be exactly what I thought it was going to be. But Hugh Grant, I think, is the best part of the film. But aside from him, there are a lot of fun characters, a lot of very in interesting characters in the story. Um, Matthew McConaughey, like I said, plays Mickey Pearson. He's the quote-unquote protagonist in the film. And while Matthew McConaughey, he's solid in the role. While he usually, you know, as you know, plays a lot of these, like, you know, out there, um, stoner types almost. He's Matthew McConaughey has proven to be, like, you know, very, very commanding in the role of this classy, yet just completely ruthless and determined drug dealer, where if you, he's someone that you can definitely grab a beer with, or in this case, you know, smoke a blunt with, um, but at the same time, if you mess with him or get in his way somehow, he, he will destroy you, and he will make you, he will make you regret it for as long as you live. So he's very solid in the role, he's all, Matthew McConaughey has always been a very watchable, very watchable actor from, you know, Dallas Buyers Club, Sandra Stellar, to Jason Confused, where, you know, he first got huge. I, Matthew McConaughey is one of the few actors where when I hear that he's in a movie, I'm actually thinking about seeing the movie just because it's him. I don't usually go for films just because of a certain actor isn't there. I usually go for the director or maybe, you know, someone who wrote the script that I might know of or I'm interested with, and of course the overall story, but every now and then you get an actor that I'm like, okay, you know what, just because this one's in this movie, I might actually end up seeing it. So I thought Matthew McConaughey was very good. Um, the man who he tries to sell his empire to is played by Jeremy Strong. It's his, he's, like I said, this wealthy, um, I believe, Jewish businessman. And I thought, you know, he, he had kind of like a flamboyant edge to him too. 
But for whatever reason, I just saw Jeremy Strong was very weak in the role. I don't know if it was just the character that he was playing. I don't know if it's just, again, what he brought to the role. I just I just thought he was very weak. I just didn't believe his presence. And it just, just didn't really do much for me. Um, aside from him, Michelle Dockery plays Mickey Pearson's wife. And I thought she was a total badass. She was, she was very... She was another one that was very interesting to watch. She was another one just like very... Very silly, but of course, like very charismatic and charming at the same time. There's that she manages to have all these qualities about her, and in a way, I, I don't know if I could say she brings balance to Matthew McConaughey's character. You know, I get I guess maybe she does because like she's a more steely type and he's a more approachable type. But they're both they're both ruthless. They're both you know they will both take your throat out if you give them a reason to. What I love about this film is that it kind of feels similar to what I've seen from Richie's other films, and by other films I may really mean only Aladdin, which I guess, you know, was kind of eh, and Sherlock Holmes, which is actually really good. So the diff- the what I noticed with The Gentleman and Sherlock Holmes, that all the words that comes out of the characters' mouths, all the cut editing cuts and action, all seem to just happen kind of like a tap dance. It's just like a very snappy feeling to it all, and it... it almost has like a very blunt feeling about it. And that's that bluntness is also shown in the film's pitch black sense of humor in that the way I see this film with its sense of humor is that if you had a stand-up comedian that just took like the most dull object possible and just smacked its audience, smacked his or her audience over the head with it, that's how this humor, this film feels in terms of the way it goes about the jokes that it tells. And so overall, I thought it was a very... I get very clever, very very interesting take on the gangster co- comedy. There's not like I can't say it's like a very high concept movie, but at the same time, there's there's there are times where a lot's kind of being thrown at you. So yes, it's very sharp, but if you're not paying quite as much attention, then you may get lost kind of easily. That happened to another friend of mine. Uh, rest in peace, Roberto. Um, so just to, just to cap things off, the gentleman is a brazen, sharp, and clever take on the gangster dark comedy with a blunt, pitch black sense of humor unconventional narrative, and memorable turns from Matthew McConaughey and Hugh Grant. I'm going to give The Gentleman an 87. So please, please go see this movie. I hope that this one doesn't get completely completely blown out at the box office by Bad Boys 2 in 1917. Um, like I said, this is definitely one of the better January releases that I've seen in a long time. So go go check this one out. All right, so now this might feel, this next bit might feel like kind of old news at this point, but it has been a, a little while since I've gotten an episode to you guys. So I wanted to talk about the headline that came out within the last couple of weeks since I la- did the last episode, which is Taika Waititi doing, a, a reportedly in talks to do another Star Wars film. And this headline captured my interest for a number of reasons. Um, of course, this is fresh off of episode nine coming out. And I think that for what it was, and basically, especially coming after The Last Jedi, I think it did a great job cleaning up a lot of the mess that The Last Jedi left behind. I know I'm not exactly sure if I'm the minority on that one. The, the reactions for The Rise of Skywalker have been kind of down the line, but I was one of the ones that really liked it. I liked it so much more than I thought I was going to. So the reason why this piques my interest is because I'm wondering to what point that we just stop making Star Wars movies and just let things be sacred the way they are. And again, Star Wars, of course, is owned by Disney now. So, you know, they're going to try and milk every last thing that they can, because according to people who know just a bit more about Star Wars than I do, there, uh, there's so much more lore that you can actually explore. So now, is all that lore really worth exploring because of the risk of, again, just leaving a bad taste in the mouths of everyone when it, it comes to Star Wars? Like, are you still going to be able to recapture that same magic that the last, I'm going to say, about nine episodes have had? Because some, are, of course, are better than others. So, and I'm a little worried that, like, we're getting a bit too saturated when it comes to Star Wars content. You know, I think there comes a point where studios should trust new stories, trust other... I don't know if I can really say trust other filmmakers, because Taika Waititi is definitely not the problem here. Um, But I think there just comes a point where, you know what, like, let's try telling a different story. Let's try doing something different. Now, again, going to Taika Waititi, 
I, in, in, in terms of him being a filmmaker, I'm, I'm very, very confident in him. Now, from the episode, from what I've heard of his work on The Mandalorian, I have not gotten a chance to watch The Mandalorian. I don't even have Disney+. Plus. But based on what I've heard from, again, an, other people who are closer to me and are a little more well-versed in Star Wars content, he directed a couple episodes of the show. And from what I understand, he seems, to, it seems that he did a very good job with it. Now, him, now Waititi's films seem to have like a very quirky and comedic edge to him, to his work. You know, he resurrected the Thor franchise, um, Thor 1. Uh, Thor 1 was fine when it came out, but looking in the last few years, I don't think it's Asia as well. doesn't um, stand tall with the rest of the pantheon of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, Thor The Dark World, uh, I'm not going to lie, I forget that movie even came out. Um, and, of course, I remember that Kat Dennings' character just annoyed the crap out of me throughout the entire movie that she was actually in the film. And then Thor Ragnarok came along, which was actually a lot of fun. It was honestly one of the funniest movies I've seen in a very long time. Easily one of the funniest movies in the MCU. Even though the film dragged a bit because I felt like it went for the gag just a bit too much. And extended things that really, or dragged things out that really didn't need to be dragged out. It was still a blast watching the film. And I think that him directing Thor Ragnarok, or really him coming into the Thor franchise, is... Probably the best thing that's happened to that particular franchise. And then, of course, you have Jojo Rabbit, which is just a wonderful, wonderful film. I mean, think about it. It's a, it's a satirical comedy about Nazis. On the surface, that seems like a, an unmakeable film. <laughs> that seems like something that would just be impossible to pull off. And he does it so well. He directed the film, wrote the script. He even played freaking Hitler. I, I remember watching him in an interview when he was asked, you know, oh, was he the first choice? His first choice to play Hitler, and he's just like, oh yeah, of course, a Polynesian Jew, yeah, I mean, <laughs> of, course, of course, but no, he, he does very well in every single department, in every single role that he has associated with Jojo Rabbit. The film is up for a few Oscars right now, and it deserves every single bit that it's being recognized for. So, YTD himself isn't exactly the problem. I'm worried that, like, you know, will his quirky comedic edge mesh well with the Star Wars film. And from what I heard from his episodes of The Mandalorian, those episodes don't have that same edge that Jojo Rabbit and Thor Ragnarok have in terms of its sense of humor. But the way I see it is that jo Psycho Waititi didn't direct the first couple episodes of The Mandalorian. What I notice is that with a lot of TV shows, they'll bring in a very prolific director to set the course of the show. Like, you know, David Fincher for A House of Cards, Martin Scorsese for Boardwalk Empire... And that usually kind of sets up how the show is going to be, tonally, you know, emotionally, and, you know, all that jazz. Um, that wasn't the case with YTD and The Mandalorian, if I'm not mistaken. John Favreau did the first couple episodes of The Mandalorian, and he's a very talented guy. So I'm wondering how YTD will handle, if, he, if this gets finalized, him actually doing a Star Wars film, I wonder how he will handle doing something like a Star Wars film when he's involved from the beginning of... The particular story and will his style mesh well with something like a star wars film and it's possible that it can i mean i think and i'm sure if you told if i knew what i knew about taika waititi before thor ragnarok and after the first two thor films came out i might have said ah you know i'm not really sure if he would be if he would be good to do a thor movie and honestly i'm not even sure how well thor ragnarok fills in with or excuse me fits in with the other two films but honestly I don't, I'm not really sure how much that matters because, like I've said, that's that's easily the best one in the entire franchise so far. So, I think this this headline, this idea of him doing a Star Wars film, I think there's still a lot that's up for debate. I think we just need to see where exactly this goes. But I can't say I'm entirely doubtful. I mean, there's the cynic in me is wondering why, like, you know, we got to keep making Star Wars movies. I mean, of course, there's a, there's a magic that comes with Star Wars films, but at what point does that... Does that magic run out and just end off, off on a low note? Okay, so continuing with the idea of possibly unnecessary films being made, Mean Girls the Musical is getting a movie adaptation. Not making this up. Not making this up at all. I saw the headline on, online, and I had to read it not once, not twice, but three times just to make sure what I was reading was A... Not a, not a headline from The Onion, and B, not a typo. I Now, here's the thing. Mean Girls, of course, is a classic. The, fil the 2004 film is a classic. It's a great film. It's very smart, hilarious throughout. It deserves every 
bit of classic status that it has. It's definitely one of the best high school comedies I've ever seen. When it was made, when I heard about it being made into a musical, of course I was a bit skeptical, and I'm not gonna lie, I have not seen the musical. I cheated a little bit and I just read the synopsis online. And from what I got from that was that it's basically pretty much the same movie with just some songs thrown in here and there. And again, I listened to some of the soundtrack too, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm probably gonna forget about the songs by tomorrow. So now, now of course you have this being made into a film. And I can't help but wonder, why? Why? <laughs> why Why does this have to happen? Why does this have to be made? I mean, again, we know why it's being made, because it'll probably make a decent amount of money, at least so we think at the moment. But I can't seem to find a reason for, you know, justifying the film being made. This would now be the third, the third Mean Girls ad narrative adaptation, narrative telling, within a, the course of a, less than two decades. So, uh, the only bit of hope, and again, of course, you know, you have Lauren Michaels coming back to produce, and then the only, Tina Fey is writing the screenplay, she's the only bit of hope that I have for this film. Again, she's obviously had um, a huge influence on the story, she wrote the, or, she wrote the screenplay for the film, first film, can't believe I'm saying that, first film, and if there's anyone who can actually make this somewhat decent, it's her. But again, this goes back to the point that I was make, saying with Taika Waititi doing Star Wars, and that is someone who's a competent filmmaker, a competent storyteller enough to bring life to a movie that maybe shouldn't be made, that is just unnecessary, that you just can't seem to justify. So I think the odds are definitely stacked against this one for sure. Um, and again, this isn't anything have against like you know movie musicals or anything like that. I loved the new Les Miserables movie, that's the musical that Tom Hooper did. You know, the guy who directed Cats, but, you know, backhanded compliments aside, I love Les Miserables. Um, when I heard about In the Heights being adapted into a film, again, In the Heights is one of those musicals that I kind of wish I saw, but when I heard about a film adaptation for that one, I was actually intrigued. I said, okay, that's actually interesting. I feel like there's something that you can get differently from stage to screen in that transition. And I'm not sure that with Mean Girls and Musical that you're going to get anything different from from its transition from stage to screen. I feel like, honestly, if you just film, if you just film the Broadway performance of Mean Girls and Musical with a camera, you're just, you're probably going to get the same impact, the same effect as if you are just to make a flat-out movie based on this one. Like I said, I can't understand why they're making this one other than just to make money. And here's the thing, of course, the vast majority of films are made to... Sorry to sound like a cynical asshole, but the vast, the vast majority of films today are made for money. Because, of course, you know, if a movie doesn't make money, if you don't make money off your movies, you can't keep making movies, of course. But can you at least do a better job of hiding it? Can you at least not make it as obvious? I mean, I don't think we're asking for too much, because, of course, you know, there are plenty of people out there with original stories, with innovative... Um, with original stories, with innovative narratives that could be given a shot instead of a musical, a movie musical, that's just not, that's just not going to bring anything new. So, honestly, for, at least for the moment, again, I, with Taika Waititi's Star Wars film, I definitely have more hope and confidence in that one than I do for this one. And when I saw this one, I couldn't help but cringe and laugh a little bit. So, you know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Again, I... Don't like talking in absolutes, but I'm not confident that this is going to go anywhere worth going. So, again, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see, you know, how development goes. We'll see what comes out in terms of, you know, um, released footage and stuff like that. We'll see, how this we'll see how this actually turns out. But at the moment, I, my confidence is through the floor. It's not, <laughs> I, I don't have a good feeling about this one at all. All right, and to finish off the show, I'm going to finally, at long last, reveal my top 10 films of the 2010s. This is a segment that I've been wanting to do for a little while, but between other stories coming up, and again, just me being sick last week, I haven't gotten a chance to do it. So what the 2010s have been a very influential decade in film for me. This is the decade where I feel like I've become more a more mature moviegoer, and this is the decade where, of course, I've turned into more of an actual filmmaker so I think it was this during this sort of transitional time period in my life is 
the, or all this is really during a pretty transitional time in my life where I feel like there are so many films from this decade that have influenced me so greatly that have changed the way I look at movies and look at what movies can do and what they're capable of. So, and this is apparent in just how many just honorable mentions that I'm, I'm going to be giving. Now, there are certain films that, even though they aren't on my list, that I think that they're going to be remembered for in the decade. And so, like, some of those films that come to mind are, of course, um, Get Out, Mad Max Fury Road. Um, I think just for the whole Best Picture debacle a couple years ago, Moonlight and La La Land have kind of, you know, marched their way into legendhood. So, without further ado, I'm just going to start off with my honorable mentions, and they are The Lighthouse, They Shall Not Grow Old, Parasite, Roma, La La Land, Marriage Story, Joker, American Hustle, Django Unchained, Dunkirk, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. All right, and to start off the top, the actual top 10 list, coming for, to us from, all the way from 2012 is Silver Linings Playbook. The film follows Pat Solitano Jr., a man with bipolar depression, as he struggles to rebuild his life after an eight-month stint in a mental institution. Things get even more complex after meeting a girl with personal issues of her own. The film is directed and written for the screen by David O. Russell and is based on the novel of the same name by Matthew Quick and stars and is a completely stat cast Bradley Cooper, Jennifer Lawrence, Robert De Niro, Chris Tucker, and Jackie Weaver. Now, the films from David O. Russell that I've seen are, of course, Silver Linings Playbook and American Hustle. I've also seen The Fighter and Flirting with Disaster. American Hustle was, the I believe, the first R-rated film that I got to see in the theater, and Flirting with Disaster, I had to watch for my narrator screenwriting class. Wasn't as crazy about that one. So, for, based on those four films, this is definitely his best film. And one of the things that I really love about the film is that it deals with very, very heavy subjects, you know, depression, bipolar disorder, and it does it while managing to be really, really funny at the same time, but it pays a lot of respect to the issues that it deals with. And this particular subject hits very close to home for David O. Russell, because if I'm not mistaken, his son has bipolar disorder, and it's obvious that that sensitivity that comes with experiencing something like that he brings that all to this film. It's a very, very funny film, and it's, like I said, very, very sensitive to its topics. There's so many moving parts to this particular story, and it handles them all very, very well. Now, I also had to read the book, I believe, in 12th, my senior year of high school. And while the book was really good, I honestly felt like the movie was better. A lot of times when it comes to books being adapted into movies, you feel like, and if you're really loyal to the book, you feel like something is missing from the transition from book to film. But honestly, I saw the movie first and then read the book. And based on that, I felt like there was something missing in the book as opposed to the movie. I just felt like the movie had just more, it just had more weight to it. And I think that particularly goes with um, Robert De Niro's character, Pat Saltano Sr. I just felt like he had more layers to him and that was put on more display. Um, but... This is one of those films that, of course, even though at its core is a romantic comedy, you can kind of see when it gets, when the film ends, you can look back and just be like, okay, you know, I probably could have seen that coming. But the way this film ends off didn't bother me at all because of what it goes through, what it puts you through just to get to that final destination. Like all the, you know, troubles and turbulence that that occurs between Bradley Cooper's character and Jennifer Lawrence's character and of course Brad between Bradley Cooper's character and the rest of his family there's just so much going on it's such a roller coaster from start to finish um, and then of course to anchor the film you have what I think are career best performances from Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence Jennifer Lawrence won the Academy Award that year and Bradley Cooper was nominated but he lost to Daniel Day Lewis and Lincoln I think Cooper should have taken it I think when it comes to winning awards not necessarily acting and taking on certain roles but when it comes to winning awards Going for historical figures is definitely the low-hanging fruit. I think Bradley Cooper had a much, just had a much more substantial performance. Um, and then, of course, on top of Cooper and Lawrence, um, this is Robert De Niro is probably my favorite performance. He gave my favorite performance in the entire film as he, you know, rough around the edges, but at the same time, very, very emotional and, you know, OCD father of, you know, Pat Salatano Jr. This is my, this is the best performance from Robert De, 
excuse me, from Robert De Niro, since honestly, probably Casino. So this is honestly, this is a very, very good film. I love Silver Linings Playbook so much. It was one of those, it has, the rewatch value on this film is insanely high, which is pretty astonishing considering, like I said, the topics that it deals with. Okay, so coming in at number nine from 2016 is Arrival. Arrival follows a linguist as she cooperates with the military to investigate an extraterrestrial visit with unknown intentions. The film is directed by Denis Villeneuve and is adapted for the screen by Eric Heiserer from the short story, Story of Your Life, by Ted Chiang. The film stars Amy Adams, Jeremy Renner, and Forrest Whitaker. Now, what stand, one of the things that stands out to me the most about this film is how much it's rooted in realism. Of course, you know, there's no proof of, like, you know, any... There's no concrete proof of extraterrestrial life out there, like, you know, that they have any plans on coming to Earth, but there's a very down-to-earth yet cinematic aesthetic that comes with this film. It shows what kind of effects that something like this could possibly have on, like, you know, global conflicts and how, you know, everyone else all over the world would react to something like this. And there's a very everyman quality of, everyman-like quality of its characters. The visuals in this film are absolutely stunning, from the, just the visual effects to the cinematography. Um, this is a very, the other thing that stands out to me the most in this film is how just cerebral it is. It's not like, you know, a bunch of like, you know, laser beams and explosions like you might expect from other sci-fi films. This is sci-fi for the deep thinker and it's a very slow and steady film. It doesn't, what, even though it's slow and steady, it doesn't drag. This, but this is definitely for a more patient movie go. If you're expecting something like, you know, a Star Wars, when you hear the sci-fi genre. This probably, this won't meet your expectations. Um, but either way, this is very, like I said, this is very cerebral. This is very meditative throughout most of his film, but at the same time, it ends up being very, very emotional. And that's not something I saw coming. There's a bit of an emotional part in the introduction of the film, but you know, I didn't think that it would end up playing as big of a part as it did. And that surprise ends up being turns out to be one of the best endings that I've ever seen in a film. I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that I cried my eyes out during the at the end of this movie. I'll never forget, I'm sitting in the theater, and the ending, of course, is running its course, and I'm coming to terms with so much of what the film is saying, and like you know the music that they use, and I remember looking at my friend Roberto, and I'm like, Roberto, am I crying? Like I was shocked that something like this was actually making me cry, but it was, and I'm not ashamed to say it at all. This is a film that maybe interested in Denis Villeneuve as a director. Uh, he's I've seen from him Sicario and Blade Runner, both of which are great movies. Um, but I think this is his, This is so far, this is his masterpiece. All right, now, at number eight, coming to us from 2018 is Hereditary. Hereditary follows a series of sinister supernatural events as they plague a family after the death of their suspicious matriarch. The film stars Tony Collette, Alex Wolfe, Gabriel Byrne, and Mila Shapiro, and it's directed and written by Ari Aster. Now, this is one of those films where I'm never going to forget where I was when I saw it. I remember like the theater that I saw it in, the relative position of my seat. I remember getting a seat towards the back in case, for whatever reason, I just wanted to run out because of all the scary things I heard about this movie, but I ended up making it through the entire film. Now, this is one of those horror films that have so much going on other than just the scares. There's so much more to this film. There's so much more to the story. When the film isn't being just, you know, brutal or even sick in the imagery it puts on the screen, there's a lot of searing family drama to complement it, to go with it. Now, this isn't one of those films where something scary is popping out every second or every minute or every even every scene. This is a much slower yet more suspenseful film so you feel like something's going to happen throughout the entire duration of the film even when it doesn't but you're always on edge because you know your senses are just tingling like okay like something something bad's gonna happen i don't know if it's now i don't know if it's soon i don't know if it's gonna be later but you just feel like you're on edge the entire time and so which that helps give the film like a very very che chilling atmosphere and then of course when something horrific does come out does pop out at you, then it's not something that you're going to forget for a very long time. There are certain images from the film that are still ingrained in my brain. There's one in particular that happens to a certain character, I want to say, early to the middle, 
portion of the film that I remember seeing that. I'm like, oh my God, they went there. <laughs> and I still, to this day, can't believe it. But on top of that, of course, performances across the board are absolutely amazing. Tony Collette, wow, what an incredible performance. That is honestly not only one of the best performances I saw that year, it's one of the best performances I've seen this decade. And I still can't believe that the movie across the board got snubbed at the Oscars, but her especially. What the hell was the Academy thinking that year? They did a terrible job picking the nominees that year. This was, you know, this is a fine example as to how there are a lot of times where they just don't know what the hell they're doing when it comes to voting in um, not films to be nominated. But Tony Collette is incredible. Alex Wolf gave uh, the other standout performance in the film. It's very well-crafted overall. The musical score is excellent. And all of this culminates into one of the most unforgetful, un, or excuse me, unforgettable climaxes and finales that I've ever seen. Like this part of the ending of the film is pure insanity. And I'm like, wow, I, I wouldn't have been able to call that at all. Like it was very, very well done. I loved Hereditary so, so much. This is the, uh, this is the film of 2018. This and Roma are the, were the films of 2018 that I could not shut up about. <laughs> now docking in at number seven is Her from 2013. Her follows a lonely writer in the near future as he enters an emotional romantic relationship with his personal operating system. Directed and written by Spike Jones and stars Joaquin Phoenix, Rooney Mara, Amy Adams, and Scarlett Johansson as the writer's operating system, which goes by the name of Samantha. Now, this film is definitely, it was a huge risk. This film is definitely not something that would appeal to everybody, at least at face value. It's definitely a very strange concept, basically a man dating his computer. But... Once you get past the central premise, there's honestly a beautiful love story here. It's a very imaginative and original film. It, despite the riskiness in its story, it doesn't play it safe throughout the course of its story. Once you're in, once it gets into the story and it gets moving, it goes all in, and it's from that, of course. When you basically go as much as you can into a story like this one, you know, it had a very soulful effect. I remember I watched this, I watched this film right after my heart got broken by someone that I really cared about. And I'm not going to lie, watching this, you know, kind of you know, really good, if I'm being brutally honest with you. But it did it in the best way possible. Watching this film almost felt cathartic to me. So I definitely watched this at the right time. And the film, of course, takes place in the near future and has a dazzling vision of what the near future could possibly look like. There's a very glossy, but at the same time, realistic feel to it. And we're like, you know what? I kind of feel like this is how the future could possibly look. And of course, the cinematography and production design, you know, play a huge part in bringing that effect. And then, of course, on top of all that, this film wouldn't be anywhere without the performances from Joaquin Phoenix and Scarlett Johansson. This is probably among the best performances I've ever seen from Joaquin Phoenix. It's just show, this is probably I think this is the film that got me interested into him as an actor. And just the kind of talent, as strange as he is, strange of a duck as he is, the kind of talent that that guy has when it comes to committing himself to a role and bringing everything he's got to the screen. So both him and I think Scarlett Johansson were absolutely robbed of Oscar nominations that year. So as strange as this film was, this film was a huge risk, but I think it was pulled off so, so well. All right, now, coming in at number six, from all the way from 2010, is Inception. Now, there's no way you haven't heard of this one. So Inception follows a robber on the run who uses dream-sharing technology to steal valuable corporate ideas, is given the task of planting an idea, instead of stealing, planting an idea into the mind of a CEO. The film was directed and written by Christopher Nolan, and the film stars Leonardo DiCaprio, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Marion Cotillard, Tom Hardy, Ellen Page, and Ken Watanabe. Now, of course, this film is obviously very, very original, and it's very ambitious and very complex. One of the things that stands out to me the most about this film is not only all the high-level concepts that are being thrown at you, but at the same time, this intelligence is perfectly balance with the emotion that comes with this film. Now, in terms of intelligence versus emotion, I think intelligence has a slight edge over emotion, but they, when the two of them come together in this film, it's balanced out very, very well. Um, there's an array of stellar characters. I remember when talks for a sequel were happening when in terms of this film, 
there was one of those things where I wouldn't have mind. There was a time where I wouldn't have minded a sequel with these characters. I thought that would have been an interesting route to go down to see what else you could do with these people. But you know what? It doesn't look like that's happening, at least for the time being. And I think now, a decade later, it's too late for that. So this film is fine as a standalone. This is a film that, at least to me, showed Christopher Nolan as a master filmmaker. The narrative in this film, which of course he wrote, doesn't take the easy way out with all the complex ideas that it tools with. And now Christopher Nolan, of course, did The Dark Knight. And this was, I think in his career, that was a film that showed him as just like, you know, a masterful filmmaker, but Inception is one that showed him to be an auteur. That showed the kind of particular vision that Christopher Nolan has. And I think that's, Inception is the one that brought him as a name into the filmmakers, into the main, into mainstream filmmaking. So, and on top of that, of all that, the technical production is absolutely flawless. There's another one that feels very lifelike, despite its fantastical concepts. The musical score is one of the best I've ever heard. I love Hans Zimmer's score. Hans Zimmer is a is an absolute genius. This is one of the films that I could definitely see being very easily associated with the 2010s. All right. Now, coming in at number five from this past year is, of course, The Irishman. This is my number one film of 2019. It follows the life and mob career of, hit, of mob hitman and union teamster Frank Sheeran, who reveals his alleged involvement in the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa, directed by Martin Scorsese. Cast of legends De Niro, Pesci, and Pacino. Script from Steven Zalian, based on the book I Heard You Paint Houses by Charles Brandt. Now, without going too much into it, because again, I have talked about this film before. This is one of Martin Scorsese's masterpieces of the 2010s. This just further highlights the kind of filmmaker that he is, the kind of energy that he has as a filmmaker in his upper 70s now. I, when I look at something like this, the massive undertaking that this film was, again, three and a half hours long, so many moving pieces to the story, the production. I'm, I'm astonished that someone of, of course, his age was able to pull off something like this. That, and I'm sure something, doing something like this just knocks the heart out of you, and he just does it so well. This film doesn't show, shows that he doesn't have any signs of slowing down. This shows the kind of filmmaker that he is, and then I think this builds on his other films. Whereas films like Goodfellas, which I think you could compare this one to, doesn't have nearly as much of an emotional root as, say, The Irishman does. So The Irishman builds on films like Goodfellas by having a more profound and poignant ending. And so this shows that, you know, you can, you, that you can indeed teach an old dog new tricks. All right, coming in at number four from 2017 is Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Now, this is my number one film of 2017. Months after the brutal death of her daughter, a grieving mother challenges and harasses the local police department with billboards calling them out and asking why the crime hasn't been solved yet. The film is directed and written by Martin McDonough and stars Francis McDormand, Woody Harrelson, and Sam Rockwell. Now, this film is just as darkly hilarious as it is searing in its drama and emotion. This is one of the, I remember just laughing my ass off throughout a big chunk of this film to the point where I almost pissed myself. And then at the, almost in what appeared to be like, you know, the next scene over, it felt like the film felt like it was just taking a jackhammer to all of my feels. And especially because there's this one voiceover monologue in particular after the demise of a certain character. I don't want to give it away, but I remember it hitting me much harder than I thought it was going to. Now, the of course, the film like has a very heavy central premise, but for whatever reason, with its dark and comedic tone, I didn't think that there would be as many emotional moments as there were. And I remember with this particular monologue, I didn't quite cry, but I remember my eyes getting at least a bit watery. So that was that was something that I didn't see coming. Now, Martin McDonough, of course, pulls no punches with anything that he does in this movie, from the way that he makes the characters talk to the way to the things that he makes the characters do. Um, this film is politically incorrect in the best way possible, and it feels like just a middle finger to everything, <laughs> to everybody and everything. It's a very angry film, but at the same time, it doesn't feel bitter, if that makes sense, and that's fine. That's totally fine. Every single person in this film, to an extent, you can kind of see why they do the things they do, to an extent. Um, and then, of course, you have a terrific ensemble, um, led mainly by, of course, Francis McDormand, Sam Rockwell, and Woody Harrelson. All of them give 
some of the best perform career best performances in my opinion. This is the best stuff I've ever seen from them. And the characters that the cast is given are all very layered. They all feel like they have a point to being in the story. They all feel developed. None of them feel shallow at all. And the, of course, to top it all off, the film ends up being kind of open ended, which works in my opinion, because you don't always get the salvation that you want after something terrible happens to you in your life. And you know what? It's definitely not the easy way out, which I admire very much about the film. Now, I've seen three films from Martin McDonough. I've seen, of course, this one in Bruges and Seven Psychopaths. Three Billboards is by far his best film. I haven't heard about him doing any other films, but I have no idea how he's going to top this one coming up. All right, so now my number three pick is Birdman, coming to us from 2014. This is my favorite film of 2014. Um, I was very happy when it won Best Picture over Boyhood at the Oscars, and I remember thinking to myself, finally, the Academy picked the best movie of the year to win Best Picture. So the film follows a former comic book actor as he tries to prove his worth as an artist by mounting a successful Broadway production. The film stars Michael Keaton, Emma Stone, Edward Norton, Amy Ryan, Naomi Watts, and Zach Galifianakis, and is directed by Alejandro Gonzalez Inarritu. I hope I'm saying his name right. Now, the ambition of this film is absolutely insane, and it's ambitious and just high-reaching in both its technical production and storytelling. There's an underlying conflict between art house and mainstream entertainment, and that's a conflict that I very much appreciate being portrayed in a film. And I think, that, of course, that's especially prevalent with you know, all these indie filmmakers trying to make a name for themselves in a film market that's so saturated with, you know, 10 Fast and Furious films and 20 plus Marvel Cinematic Universe films. So I love that this film was able to portray something like that. Um, the characterization is just flat out gripping. Not only is, are all the main characters integral to the story, but everyone is not only well developed, but very interesting as well. The film has a pitch black sense of humor. It can be very, very bizarre, but at the same time, very brazen in its sense of humor. And of course, it was very thought provoking, especially the ending. I remember the ending of the film being debated long after I first saw it in the theater. Um, and then, of course, on top of all this, probably one of the things that it's known for the most is the one shot illusion. This is the first film that I can at least remember pull, trying to pull off this sort of thing. Um, and I think. And again, this didn't feel gimmicky, at least with this film, because at least to me, because the film, of course, centers on someone trying to mount a play. And then, of course, you know, a play, for the most part, are, is a nonstop show. And this one-shot illusion made this film feel like a nonstop show. And what I thought was just absolutely crazy is that you have, like, all these long shots mixed with these, you know, long and rapid-fire dialogues with, like, you know, all these complex and extended motions and actions from everybody on the screen which i thought was just absolutely jaw-dropping the cast is absolutely incredible and then of course the standout performances come from michael keaton and edward norton michael keaton i think should have won the oscars that's the oscar for best actor that particular year like what i was saying with bradley cooper versus daniel day lewis uh, mike you know when it comes to playing real life characters i feel like that's you know that's the easy way out in terms of like winning awards but and then Michael Keaton lost to Eddie Redmayne in The Theory of Everything, who played Stephen Hawking. But Michael Keaton should have absolutely won that year. And from the three films that I've seen from Inuritu, this one, The Revenant, and Babel, this is definitely his best film. So I want to see if there's ever a point that he can actually top Birdman. All right, coming in at number two is The Wolf of Wall Street. This is my one of my favorite films from 2013. This follows the rise and fall of Jordan Belfort as we follow him through his involvement in corruption, greed, and excess as a Wall Street stockbroker in the 80s and 90s. The film is directed by Martin Scorsese and stars Leonardo DiCaprio, Jonah Hill, and Margot Robbie. The film is written for the screen by Terrence Winter and is adapted from the book by Jordan Belfort. Now, I remember saying before, whether it's in this episode or another episode, that Martin Scorsese managed to make two masterpieces this decade. First, the other one was The Irishman. This was his first one. This is an epic, dark comedy, and I don't feel like I've ever seen any other movies at this funny with this kind of scale. This is, film has a three-hour runtime, and it just never drags. It's hilarious from start to finish, and of course, it's all about 
accents, of course, from the runtime to just like, you know, the language that it uses. Um, and it never once, as the film, feels self-indulgent in any way, which I think is very interesting. Um, the film, of course, is as bold as it is explicit. In terms of all the things that could win a film a more mature rating, you know, of course, violence, um, language, sex, and all that, you name it, it's got it. <laughs> and I'm still kind of stunned that a movie this explicit was made by someone who in his at the time was still in his 70s. Um, of course, and there are so many like just iconic scenes and lines throughout this entire film. You can cherry pick them all throughout. Of course, the cast is led by Leonardo DiCaprio and Jonah Hill. And not only do they give fantastic performances, some of the best I've ever seen from them, but they work as a great duo together. Okay, finally... My number one film of the 2010s comes all the way from the beginning of the decade, and that has to be The Social Network. The Social Network is the dramatization of the founding of Facebook that follows the trials and legal issues of its founders, Mark Zuckerberg and Eduardo Saverin. The film was directed by David Fincher and is written for the screen by Aaron Sorkin, based on the book The Accident of Billionaires by Ben Mesrich. The film stars Jesse Eisenberg as Mark Zuckerberg, Andrew Garfield as Eduardo Saverin, Justin Timberlake as Sean Parker, and Army Hammer in a double performance playing both Winklevoss twins, Tyler and Cameron. Now, I've seen a few films from David Fincher. We've seen Zodiac, um, Curious Case of Benjamin Button, Fight Club, and yes, and Gone, and Gone Girl as well. Now, this by far is his best film in my opinion. This film, from what I remember from the other films, seems to be his very different in a lot of ways. But I still think that this is the film that he still has yet to has yet to beat. A film that I want to say is about two hours long, and it feels very swift and slick without feeling rushed. Um, the editing put, has a lot to do with this. There's just so much going back and forth, and just like you know, and just carrying you along throughout the film, and it never feels rushed once. And it has the film has a lot going on in terms of like its heady concepts. And just like the pace that it moves at. And it never feels messy and all over the place. There are a lot of moving parts of the story. And it manages to just like feel like, you know, it's all sewn in together the right way. The leading performances from Jesse Eisenberg and Andrew, and Andrew Garfield are absolutely terrific. Um, Garfield in particular, I think, again, was robbed of an Oscar nomination. Script, like I said before, was written by Aaron Sorkin. And in my opinion, he's the best screenwriter working today. The man is a genius with the page and his this particular screenplay is one of my all-time favorite screenplays period out of any movie i've ever seen this is probably my favorite adapted screenplay i'm stunned with how intelligent this film is and i first saw it when i want i want to say it was about 13 14 years old and i and i while well, i was still interested in it, i didn't get it as much because there are a lot of like you know heady concepts that it plays with and just the way that everyone talks in this film. So, you know, very, very high class, very erudite, and just very, just highly intellectual. And it took me years to fully grasp what everyone was saying and the weight of what everyone was saying. But now that I do, I, I can't help but feel, <laughs> I can't help but feel smarter. It's, it's, it was the weirdest feeling the more and more I picked up on when watching this film. You know, I remember always hearing that, like, you know, if you want your younger kids to be smart, you know, make, make them watch Baby Mozart. If you want your teens to, if you want your middle, mid-teens to, like, you know, older teenagers to get smarter, make them watch this movie. <laughs> that's, that's just how high concepts this film actually is. Um, on top of that, of course, the music is absolutely wonderful. There's a very techno aspect to the score, which I didn't think would play well, with Academy voters, but it ended up winning Best Original Score over Inception. Don't know how that happened, but if Inception had to lose to any other musical score, this would be the one that it would lose to, and it makes sense. Um, the cinematography and just the aesthetic of this film is kind of luminously dark, and I feel like that's influenced me in a filmmaker more as a filmmaker more than I would have thought, because even though I've only made a couple short films, I remember in all in at least the next short film that I plan on doing, you know, someone asked me, okay, what's the look that you want for this film? And I remember the answer that I was giving them was like, you know, kind of luminously dark and using the social network as an example. Now, the thing that stands out the most about this film and the impact and legacy that I think this film is going to have is that when it comes to not only just the 2010s in film, but just the 2010s, this is the film that I think of. Because this film 
pretty much predicted modern life as we know it. Because now, of course, social media kind of started coming up in like, you know, the 2000s, but it really blew up in the 2010s. And like I said, this predicted modern life. There's this one line in the film from Sean Parker, played by Justin Timberlake, where he basically says, first we lived in farms, then we lived in cities, now we're going to live on the internet. And if that's not how modern society operates today, then I don't know what other better way that you can possibly sum up our world as we know it. So when I think of the word masterpiece, when I think of contemporary masterpiece, this is the film that comes to mind. This is a film that is firing on all cylinders. It gets everything right. It is time. It is both timely and timeless. And then I think what's really interesting is that, like, of course, with all the recent scandals with Facebook, there's room for a sequel. There's There have been slight murmurs about like possibly doing a sequel to the social network and that and as long as they get the same people on board with the potential for like the new directions they could take the story in that is something i'm totally on board for i'd love to see exactly what they do with something like this again i don't know if that'll actually happen but i think if you made a sequel to the social network there is a lot that you can do there's a lot of potential for something like that so just like that there's my Top 10 films of the last decade. Obviously, like I said before, a very, very influential decade to me and I think to a lot of other people. And just like that, episode 5 of Real Talk is over. I hope you hope you enjoyed the show and I'd like to know, like, what exactly do you think about Taika Waititi possibly doing another Star Wars film? What do you think of Mean Girls the Musical getting adapted into a movie? Like, do you think it's actually worth it? Do you think it's necessary? You know, I'd love to, I'd love to hear what you're thinking. You know, as far as questions, comments, or anything like that, anything you'd love for me to cover on the show or talk about on the show, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to any of my social media handles. And I'm hoping that I'm more consistent with the week-to-week basis of the show. Like I said, I'm hoping I'm not too <laughs> too sick like I was uh, last week. That shouldn't be a habit of mine. And just like that, I'll see you next time around. Hope you're having a good time watching this. And I'm Joe Aserno. This has been Real Talk.